We're fortunate to have Gary Morris with us tonight, and uh, he probably knows more about Roadmap Rhode Island, the HUD connection, and its real impact than anyone in Rhode Island. Thank you all for being here. Gary Morris. Good evening, my name is Gary Morris. Um, I'm a resident of Barrington, and uh, thank you very much for being here. I know it's a horrible weather conditions to be out, so I'm very pleased that so many showed up to hear an important topic. Uh, just a quick background, how did I get involved in, with roadmap and HUD issues, which are probably some of the most boring issues known to man. Uh, I, I had been working tax policy in the town of Barrington for about the last five years. and. One of the things that began to become evident was that roadmap and programs like roadmap uh, were evolving towards a taxation policy that did not appear to be, um, to me at least, either illegal or constitutional. And so I began to do my research around those issues on taxation policy alone, and a lot of the roadmap overlap came into the tax issues that I was involved in. So that's my background on this. It's mostly from the taxation side. Um, so a question that has been um, bantered about is whether or not roadmap is economic development or a social experiment. The issue that I think um, roadmap is focused on in many ways, if you read the documents, is this issue of deconstruction of the way we have evolved our neighborhoods for the last 200 years, basically single family, large lot uh, kinds of construction. And there's some you know, important issues around development of single family neighborhoods. The question is, for an economic development plan for Rhode Island, <clears throat> given its current economic condition, is deconstruction of uh, the neighborhoods really a good thing? Uh, and the point is, and this comes from my tax background, Roadmap has absolutely no solution for the reality that a certain percentage of residential housing pays for the bulk of municipal costs. If you go and analyze any town, whether it's <clears throat> One Socket, uh, Barrington, you'll find that residential housing is what's keeping municipal budgets intact. So the question of whether or not you can deconstruct something that's actually holding uh, the ship afloat uh, is the question in my mind, and oops, I gotta get used to this. <laughs> this issue right here, I, I put the roadmap plan up on a word uh, document, 90,000 words approximately. Of the 90,000 words, about 84 talk about a property tax solution. It's one of the biggest nuts that roadmap has to solve, and yet they've got 84 words associated with a tax solution. And the 84 words really aren't uh, meaningful in my mind as to a solution. <coughs> and then in the plan, there's absolutely no mention of negative impact to property values. Now, I'm not here to say we're, we're all charged with <coughs> protecting property values, but it is the issue of the property tax base is what establishes how budgets are actually parsed out in the towns. So the property tax base is very important. Home values are very important. <coughs> now, one of the things that, if you read the documents, one of the things that uh, comes out loud and clear is the old concept of Camelot, the, the Kennedy compound, so to speak. That's bad. Co-op city is much better. So what's at stake when you start to deconstruct the, the neighborhoods as we know them, uh, there are three things for the Rhode Island homeowner that seem to come out in the analysis. Whether or not there are going to be mandated municipal infrastructure upgrades. This could be where you don't have sewers today, a mandate that says you will put in sewers in order to uh, improve, let's say, the growth centers, the roadmap growth centers. Uh, you won't have any choice on it. Uh, this issue of two different ta property taxpayers. What 
I'll talk about in a little bit is what it means to roadmap to have two different property taxpayers in every town. Uh, to pay for things like school, water, roads, sewers, police, and fire. And then, as I mentioned, the deconstruction of single-family zoning as we know it. Okay, how does two different taxpayers actually work? Uh, most of you who are, if you have a home in town, the way you get your property taxes is the town determines what the municipal budget is going to be. From that budget, they know what the total assessments are in the town. And so you simply come up with a mill rate times whatever assessment there is in your house. You get all of the increases, so if there are going to be sewers, if there's no more teachers in school, it's all apportioned to the taxpayers under this mill rate times the assessment plan. The second property taxpayer that's beginning to evolve under the roadmap plan is what's called income capitalization. And income capitalization is nothing more than saying, if I can collect this much rent, then a percentage of that <clears throat> will be a multiple of what I pay in taxes. So for example, uh, in, the, in the case of subsidized rental income, the formula right now is to take the annual rent that's collected, multiply it times 8%, and <clears throat> that's how you come up with your taxes. Now, the interesting thing about this is that there is no increase in your property taxes. If you suddenly decide that you want uh, 20 new teachers in your schools, these folks will pay for that, these folks won't. And that's one of the problems that I see is the taxes are not linked to the municipal budget <clears throat> under this two-tiered property tax system. <clears throat> So we have property taxpayer one, I'd like all the services his money can buy. This is the, what's called the, uh, <clears throat> the mill rate times your assessment. This is the tax burden over here, a much smaller tax burden. It, when you compute it out, it's about one fifth what the average homeowner is actually paying. So if you're paying $2,000 a year in property taxes, the person over here will be paying about one-fifth that on equivalent houses. And, and I've, I'll show you how this works out in just a moment. So the whole roadmap plan is promoting a system of two different taxpayers. Those who pay and those who don't. And they're using clever language like tax reform. Tax reform really means we want to use this income capitalization approach for those people that go into things like growth centers um, and affordable housing. Okay, you'll find it in all the roadmap documents. Virtually every roadmap document has a section on reforming the property tax system. So if you go through even the uh, <coughs> transfer and developments document, reform the property tax system to be uh, in a manner that supports smart growth. Uh, the state, the older uh, 2001 state guide plan. And even MIT got involved in this. Uh, MIT was a part of Roadmap. They did their own little development plan. And the interesting thing about MIT is they said the same thing. You've got to have property tax incentives, particularly in the growth centers. And uh, they're basically saying the same thing, that you have to have, you have to lower the taxes for a certain class of people that are in these growth centers. So everybody else gets to pay the larger amount. People in the second class get to pay about one-fifth of that amount. The nice thing about what MIT did, if you read that document, is they said what the state should do is come in and supplement whatever the town is losing as a result of this lower tax rate. The state has an obligation to come in and pitch in and help to offset that. Uh, I haven't heard anything at the state level where the state is actually going to do this. Right now what they're saying is the municipalities will be responsible for implementing these uh, taxation policies. Okay. Give you an example. The town of Richmond just approved this 8% of rent income capitalization uh, 
formula. It was just done on uh, last month, January the 20th. And it's for all affordable, all deed restricted affordable housing. <clears throat> and that can be low income and moderate income. Okay, to give you an example of how this works out, they used an example. I, I pulled the minutes of the discussion in the January 20th town council meeting, and there was talk of there was talk about this threshold right here, a $641 a month rent, which is approximately 50% of the area median income, uh, which works out if you take a look at um, a, an example. It's about 25,300 a year. Those are HUD numbers. And similar properties would come in. We're talking about someone that's only making about 23 or 25,000. So I, I don't know if you have $125,000 properties here. I know that's pretty low threshold, but um, this is what I estimate um, the, the rental properties would come in at. Now, how I have come to that is most of the affordable housing projects are going in at an amount where each unit is roughly in the range of about $250,000 to $275,000 for the cost of putting up these projects. And that's based on the actual HUD documents that I pulled on two projects in Barrington, uh, Sweetbriar and Palmer Point. So I, I've done the numbers to show that the actual fair value of these, even with the deed restriction, is somewhere around 125,000 for assessing purposes. <clears throat> this is a picture of the Sweetbriar project in Barrington. Uh, each one of these divide this house down the middle. There are two units. Every single one of these is two units. So you just chop the house down the middle and you've got two units. And there's 47 units in the whole project. Okay, here's the example. So if you took a person who had a home at 125000 and they're under 65 and not disabled, they're paying the full tax rate of $20.94 as the mill rate. So when you multiply that out, you come up with a tax right here of $2,617 for a person of modest means at the 50% area median income level. If you take exactly the same person uh, or the same financial levels and you put them under the 8% of rent formula, the annual tax bill is only $615. So you can see 2,617 versus $615 in an annual property tax bill, 425% higher for the person that doesn't get the benefit of an income capitalization scheme. This is what Roadmap is really trying to do, is develop income capitalization versus comparable sales. The seventh highest on a per capita basis in the nation. So even before we start rolling out some of these programs, we're already one of the highest in the nation. And the Institute, the Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy noted that one of the failures, one of the regressive features of the way Rhode Island does its taxes is it doesn't take into account circuit breakers for low income non-elderly, people younger than 65. So you've got low income homeowners that get no break. If they lose their job, they're expected to pay the full weight of their taxes or they lose their house. Whereas people on an income capitalization, they're going to be enjoying a tax that's about one-fifth. Okay, one socket's fiscal solution uh, to a declining tax base. In 2012, they had to add a supplemental property tax on top of their existing property tax. The result, Companies are moving out. Lowe's and Walmart moved across the border to North Smithfield. Uh, the point is, when you tinker with the property tax base, you're not doing economic development. What you're doing is you're deconstructing hundreds of years worth of natural, organic growth, and it's the way the economies have been shaped. So to come in and suddenly say, we're going to turn the ship around, uh, doesn't necessarily produce good results, as Woonsocket has just found. And uh, 
I don't think a supplemental property tax was anything they ever thought they'd have in their future. Okay, question, how is this economic development? It's not. It's not. Okay, how did a simple request for an economic plan originally morph into a HUD overhaul of Rhode Island? Okay, this was the enabling legislation. Shall develop a written long-term economic development vision and policy for the state of Rhode Island. Okay, in October of 2011, Kevin Flynn of the Division of Planning signed a contract with HUD that if we were to get HUD funds to do this study, 1.9 million, that we would follow, and you can't read that there, but buried in here is a commitment, a contractual commitment, that we, the state of Rhode Island, <clears throat> would follow HUD's six livability principles. Now you're probably all scratching your head and saying, what are the six <laughs> livability <laughs> principles? <coughs> okay. In order to understand what the impact is, you kind of have to step back and look at where HUD has come from in order to understand where we are today. So it's good to take a look at this whole thing, the livability history. Okay, the, the issue of HUD, HUD was first uh, as a cabinet level position formed in 1965. In 1968, Congress wrote the Fair Housing Act. And it was created to ban discrimination in housing. Now buried in the act, right here, is a mandate that HUD must administer the programs to affirmatively further fair housing, AFFH. <clears throat> now I can tell you that this mandate right here sat on the shelf. Administration after administration. They weren't doing any with it, anything with it. And it wasn't really until Bill Clinton came along in 1994, and he did a uh, plan, the Presidential Performance Agreement, to reinvent HUD. And this reinvention would take into account this idea of fairness as a unifying theme for HUD's work. That HUD's mission really had to be reshaped and brought into line to what the original 1968 requirements were. The GAO took a look at it in 1995, and they basically had a problem with it because they realized it was going to cost a fortune. Um, and that the, what the Congress was really calling for was a cutback in HUD's authority and the money that they were getting. And so the GAO made their report in 1995. At about the same time uh, that HUD was reinventing itself, I'm going to get this down. Okay, they came up with this opportunity experiment, 1994. They said, let's do an experiment. And it was a demo, they called it a demonstration. And essentially what this opportunity demonstration was all about is they would provide families with children with simple rental subsidies and say, look, here's your subsidy. You go anywhere you want. Go to the suburbs, go wherever you want, and find a good place to live. And they would measure the outcome after a decade and a half to see if people actually really did improve their lives. And they would compare their success with those who were given, there were uh, 4,600 participants, and they would measure those that went out and found good surroundings to live in versus those that stayed behind in the more urban areas. Okay, this was the study, Moving to Opportunity, 1994 through 2010. Uh, 4,604 people in Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, given housing choice. And it was an expansion of an earlier Chicago program. Again, test the effects of access to low poverty neighborhoods and see what happens. Well, it was a surprise to HUD because what they found is the one thing that improved and the only thing that really improved was the health of the adults. Nothing else improved, in fact, and so they, they found that hypertension and diabetes came down in the measured adult population, but there was no impact on the schooling of the children, there was no impact on uh, virtually any other part. People weren't getting better jobs, they weren't going to college at night, they sort of stayed in place. 
So the only thing that came out of this study uh, was uh, better health in diabetes and hypertension. Everything else sort of stayed the same. So their lives were basically the same as those that they had left behind. So the experiment really showed that uh, moving people to opportunity didn't necessarily work. And this is, this is over a 15 year period. And you'll notice right here, no consistent detectable impacts on adult economic self-sufficiency or children's educational achievement outcomes, even for children who were too young to have enrolled in school at the baseline. And this was uh, Jens Lockwig, who was a professor of economics at the University of Chicago. He was the project director for pulling all of the data together at the end of the study. So the point being that <clears throat> it was a moving to opportunity study that HUD felt would be successful, found out it would not be successful. It didn't really work. Okay, so around 2009, <clears throat> after the data began to trickle out, uh, HUD reinvented itself again. And they reinvented the, it themselves under this new theme in which they would basically enforce affirmatively furthering fair housing. It would no longer be an experiment where we would trial and error. It would be a hammer uh, approach that you take HUD money, you will perform to certain requirements. And this basically came out of the Westchester lawsuit, which was filed um, back in 2006, and HUD was named as a party in what's called, uh, well, I, I won't tell you the legal term, but it was working its way through the courts from 2006 to 2009, when President Obama was elected. And in 2009, the plaintiffs called the Obama administration in and asked for their help to pull this into a settlement agreement. So in 2009, August of 2009, <clears throat> the Westchester Settlement Agreement was finalized. HUD Deputy Secretary said at the same time, until now we tended to lay dormant, this is historic because we are going to hold people's feet to the fire. And holding people's feet to the fire meant AFFH enforcement. Okay, in, two th in January of 2010, the GAO took on a mission and they said, in order to be compliant with affirmatively furthering fair housing, there's a set of documents that are federally mandated on every community that takes HUD money. The first document is called an analysis of impediments. The second is a report that would be written by every community that says, we've looked at the analysis of impediments and here's what we're going to do to fix it. So there were two documents that were required. So in January of 2010, Sorry. Uh, January of 2010, the GAO started a study to look at, they, they actually sent an email out to uh, about 500 different um, authorities around the country and said, uh, we'd like a copy of your analysis of impediments document. It's federally mandated, you're supposed to have it. Uh, and what they got back was almost nothing. It was, it was basically mush. What they found was since 1968, people who were taking HUD money were not really playing by the HUD rules, that they weren't filling out their documents properly. And they cited in the GAO report that revising the AFH <coughs> regulation is a priority for HUD. So the GAO took its mission to say, who is compliant? And what they found was almost nobody was compliant. Okay, so in 2013, in order to, in 2013, in the Federal Register, HUD filed new rules and regulations and said, we know that we probably have been lax for the last 45 years and nobody's put in documents and we haven't been checking, so we're going to have new compliance rules and they filed them in the Federal Register in July of 2013. And at the time they were filed, HUD Secretary Sean Donovan said, for the first time ever, HUD is providing data for every neighborhood in the nation, emphasizing there are no stones we won't turn, there are no places we won't go. <clears throat> the process has long been broken, and we're determined to fix it. Now, here's the issue. What does AFFH compliance actually mean? 
what does it mean to any particular community? And that's the question, and I've had that question, and I know several other towns have had this question into the division of planning. What does it mean to be compliant to HUD, and what does it mean to not be compliant to HUD? And the question of non-compliance now is, is a fairly substantial one. There's a Supreme Court case that's working its way through the courts right now that's going to have a huge impact on these, this mandate right here, permanently furthering fair housing. And the question is, depending upon how this is settled out, will developers now have the right for on-demand approval of projects? In other words, we have zoning right now. Effectively, there will be no more zoning if this, the way this works out. Any developer can come and on demand say, this is where I want to develop. Now the only thing I want your planning and zoning to do is just to make sure there's no fire hydrants and the sidewalks are the right size, but here's where I'm going to develop and that's what I'm telling you. So then the question is whether or not they will have those on demand re uh, requirements for any project. Whether or not developers will have on demand requests for property tax abatements. They put up a project and they say, we demand to have a 8% of rent property tax abatement. And that's a demand. Uh, and then whether or not municipalities will be forced uh, for increases, the cost of uh, sewers, upgrades to the water, uh, and that will go to only one set of taxpayers. Remember, the, the roadmap has two sets of taxpayers, one that pays under an income capitalization, one that pays under a comparable sales. So any municipal upgrades would only be borne by one party because those under income capitalization don't have to pay for the increasing costs of municipal budgets. Okay. Westchester, the Westchester lawsuit that I referenced, Judge Denise Cote had a motion to dismiss in 2009. And what Judge Cote said and made clear was that building affordable housing is not the same thing as affirmatively furthering fair housing certification. They are two distinct things. And the reason this is important is because this issue of whether or not any community is compliant to affirmatively furthering fair housing is now a big deal when you start taking HUD money. And you cannot point and say, well, look at all the affordable housing we have in town, because what Judge Cote said in her Westchester ruling was, yes, that's important, but that's not what affirmatively, affirmatively furthering fair housing is all about. Now, how are they going to begin to measure? How do you measure things like affirmatively furthering fair housing? Well, if you look at the documents that HUD has been releasing lately for the last year, it's all based on this one little thing right here, census tracts. Now, the town of Richmond has only one single census tract, so you're not in bad shape. But you go to places like Cumberland, they have six census tracts. So what HUD is doing is they're going out and they're looking at individual census tracts, each census tract to look at the numbers that they want to see for affirmatively furthering fair housing. They have a new tool that they're just, uh, they're just about to release in March called uh, Fair Housing Assessment. It's a fair housing assessment tool. And if you go on the HUD website, you can actually see this tool and you can see the criteria that they use. And it is based on census tracts. What does a census tract look like in South Kingston? I use this as an example. Uh, this is South Kingston. This is URI up here. Uh, there's only one compliant, according to HUD's, from HUD's criteria, which is spelled out here, which you can't possibly see, but I can tell you it's the criteria that HUD uses to measure. Uh, there's only one compliant census tract in all of South Kingston. This whole area here, just one. And it's the URI campus. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that tells you something that places that uh, might be compliant uh, might be inner city locations or college campuses. But pretty much most of South County and most of, uh, most of the whole of Rhode Island 
uh, when I did my study, there's only one single compliant municipality in the entire state, and that's Central Falls. Pawtucket is a close second, but Central Falls is the only compliant to AFFH mandates in the entire state. Okay, why is this a big deal? Well, HUD has maintained throughout all of their documents, and because roadmap is tied to HUD, that zoning creates de facto segregation and thus has a disparate impact on minority populations. The U.S. Supreme Court has yet to rule on whether or not disparate impact is actually a real claim, a real thing, but there is a pending case, oral arguments were just heard in the Texas Department of Housing versus the Inclusive Communities Project. The, you can go online and you can get the actual oral arguments and hear the justices going back and forth about this issue and, and, and it's really interesting. They, they bring up the National Football League and they bring up all kinds of things. But the point is they're about to rule on whether or not the statistics that HUD is looking for in compliance to those statistics, if you are not compliant in your municipality, what does that mean? And again, I haven't heard anyone from the Division of Planning say what that means, and a lot of people are asking. And one of the big things is whether or not an individual municipality can actually be sued because they are not compliant. And in last year, I put the question before Peter Dennehy, who is the Deputy Legal Counsel, or was Deputy Legal Counsel for the Department of Administration, and he's the guy who would answer questions like this. And I said, can the town of Barrington be sued because we're not compliant? And Barrington is not compliant along with just about every other town in the state. And he didn't know. So he said he would go to HUD. Now this was back in September. Now Mr. Dennehy retired on December the 26th, so he's no longer there. He's been replaced by a, uh, an attorney named Michael Slager. But they still, to this day, and the town of Barrington has been pushing for an answer, they do not know at this point in time whether an individual municipality can actually be hauled into court for non-compliance to affirmatively furthering fair housing. They, they don't know. So they've come out with roadmap, but they don't even know what compliance to the documents that they've signed means. And this case is very important. Uh, this case, <coughs> Texas Department, I would pay close attention to this because if it's ruled that disparate impact claims are cognizable under the Fair Housing Act, uh, I, I can see a lot of towns in the entire United States being hauled into court for noncompliance. Just as West, <coughs> Westchester was hauled into court in 2006. The point being, it will be a lot easier when the Supreme Court says that it is illegal to do this. Okay, the, the question on roadmap that, that I have is, this has been billed as an economic development plan. Now, I haven't seen any numbers. This is what I did for a career. I, I did business case analysis for 20 years. And I looked for all the data that would say, you know, here's your cost-benefit analysis, and here's, you know, what you should be doing with your property tax to protect the property tax base. None of that is in there. It, it's more like it's a social experiment. And the question is, does Rhode Island have a stable enough economy to pursue something like this? And I don't think it does. That's, I think jobs are more critical and that this issue is actually a jobs killer. And that's just, that's one man's opinion. And it's always the question, who is going to pay for this? Well, my argument is, because Roadmap is carving out two distinct property taxpayers, uh, only one of them will get the bill for all of the infrastructure that may come down uh, on their shoulders. And with that, that's uh, sort of the summary of my presentation. And um, as you can probably understand at this point, I am not uh, an advocate of roadmap, and uh, I am very much in objection. And I want to clarify that. There are some good parts to roadmap, and I've been criticized for this. We never needed to bring in HUD in order to get at the good parts. It was, they smushed the good parts together with the HUD mandates and said, okay, in order to 
take this plan, you've got to have them both. And my point has been, you didn't need HUD ever to get to the good parts of Roadmap Rhode Island. Yes? Uh, in the results of that study that he was just mentioning, you on the slideshow mentioned that the only thing that increased was the health of the adults for everything else socially and, and economically it stayed the same. Was, did, they, did that study analyze crime rates? Yes, they did. Okay, and they, the propensities were all the same? Uh, what they found that uh, in the juveniles, there was no difference in the arrest records of those that were living in suburban communities versus those with, that were living in uh, the urban settings. There was no change. Arrest rates, or did they do specific types of arrests? I'm sorry? Was it, was it only just rates of arrest, as in like an arrest is an arrest, or did they say, was it depending on the severity of the arrest? Like in one case, were they arrested for drinking underage, and other cases, were they arrested for beanie, that sort of thing? That data is available. I have not gone that deep into the data, is to look at individual, you know, down to that level of detail. But you can get all of this data is available. So you can just Google. Uh, moving to Opportunity HUD 1994, and you'll get website after website of analysis. Yes? Gary, I have kind of a, a lot of these simplistic questions. So it may cut to the chase. Um, looking for somebody or a group of people that will make out in all of this, for the builders being able to finesse and build low income housing or affordable housing at their will if they want to build it where and whatever and how much. They have a guaranteed um, group of people to buy into the housing and it's at that 8% rate. Does it seem like that th this would bring builders in who were really trying to profit from this regulation? Well, I, I'll give you a real world example. Um, 250 unit project called Kent Farms in East Providence. Uh, had HUD funding, had deed restrictions, and the deed restrictions were set to run out in 2022, okay? Uh, Pride Rock Capital uh, came in and bought it. Now, Pride Rock Capital is a wealth organization. You have to be a wealthy client in order to get that. They're not benevolent nonprofits. They are wealth uh, generating. They bought the property, all 250 units in 2012, with 10 years remaining on the deed restrictions. So the point is, real estate investment trusts, pension plans who have very long-term windows, one of the problems I have with this is they put a 30-year deed restriction on. Now 30 years in terms of long-term investors is a blink of the eye. Pension plan or real estate investment trust, 15 years, that's nothing to them. So what is happening, and, and we've seen it in Boston as well, uh, where these properties have not yet eaten up their deed restrictions, but they're being sold to for-profit enterprises because they know 10 years from now the deed restrictions go off and they have 250 market-based units. So they do a quick analysis and they say, sure, this project is great. Uh, let's jump on it and who cares about the deed restrictions? So yes, there's, there's wealth in these properties. And they don't care about the uh, destroying the tax base. They just are walking away with the profit from being able to well, you know, in, in reality, it's not their responsibility. They have a responsibility to the investors. And so, you know, they're, they're the developers or their investors, and that's their sole focus. They want to make money. So what my point is that these rules that they're talking about HUD implementing is driving. It's kind of like the, uh, the banks were. Uh, back when the uh, big uh, financial bust hit a few years ago, the banks were driven to do what they did. The community reinvestment. By <laughs> HUD. So here we have the builder driven to what they do by HUD. Well, it's, it's always the problem. You're trying to shape human nature. Yeah. Someone else is trying to, you know, shape someone else's human nature. And, and, you know, I mean, go back to the Greeks who have experimented with things like that, and, and it's never worked in all of history. There's a philosopher named Juvenal who wrote about this in ancient Rome uh, about 100 years after the you know, when Augustus Caesar was in there. And he wrote about the destruction because people became opportunists. They had the Pax Romana for 100 years or so, and all of a sudden people just became lazy and nobody was taking care of the roads. If you want to read, just Google Juvenal, 
Uh, and if you read his satires, you will think you're reading about the environment that we have today. It, it's, it's never been any different. It's human nature. Nothing new. Nothing new. Yes? So if the concern is that if we take HUD money, we then are bound to HUD's rules. Don't we already take HUD's money? Aren't we already, isn't the category kind of out of the bag? Well, that's the question that a lot of people have asked me. And HUD has admitted themselves, we just dropped the ball. And you can go back into the, like the Nixon administration. I mean, they were sabotaging uh, AFFH mandates. Every administration has basically done it. And HUD has just sort of sat back because, you know, the, the head of HUD is you know, trying to please his boss, the president. And it's really not worked up until 1994 when Bill Clinton really made the first initiative to try and fix what the original mandate was. And so, I mean, really, people ignored it. And the GAO found this as well, that nobody was filing the, the analysis of impediments documents properly. Nobody had on file the follow-up reports that were supposed to be the corrective action. I mean, there were no documents, and if you really want to read an interesting report, read the GAO's report on the analysis of impediments documents that came back, and they, they, they were saying some of it was just pure garbage, that you put the label on the cover and then there was nothing inside. So it, it's been going on for a long time, and it was only after the Westchester case when the Obama administration was brought in on this did some action start to take place on enforcement, and that's when you started to see things roll out. And in March, March, uh, sometime in March, these new regulations that were uh, listed in the Federal Register will take effect. One of those new regulations is there will be a tool, this uh, Fair Housing Assessment Tool, that what they call entitlement communities will have to go in and they'll have to put in all the data that has to be in it. They've never had to do this before. And there's a little document that HUD, that I found on HUD's website, and HUD is basically saying, the same things we're requiring of the entitlement communities, the non-entitlement communities, being Richmond, Barrington, North Kingston, whatever, they will be expected to be compliant in the same way. But they won't have to fill out the little tool, but they will expect to have satisfy the same requirements. So all of this is just happening right now, as we speak. In fact, a couple of weeks from now, there'll be uh, new rules from HUD. Go ahead. Uh, I, else have a no, uh, just to follow up on that, yeah. uh, what's, the, uh, what's the enforcement? Um, if the assessment tool determines that you know, Richmond's not compliant. Well, the, do we just not get the money? Or no. what, what's the enforcement? You, you have to go to the Westchester <coughs> documents to find out what a federal judge did against a community that certified, <coughs> excuse me, Westchester certified for years that they were compliant. And they were doing what, you know, every other municipality or, or county has done throughout the entire United States. They weren't unique. But Westchester was big, they were an easy target, so they were sued. <clears throat> Federal Judge Cote received a motion to dismiss. And it's that document that you really want to read, plus the settlement statement, that it, it tells what a federal judge, how a federal judge evaluates the problem, evaluates what went wrong, and what the recommended correction was. Now, in the case of Westchester, the original settlement called for $51 million worth of new construction. Ah, thank you. Excuse me. Much better. <clears throat> uh, the settlement said that Westchester, through local taxes, the local taxpayers, had to fund 750 units, <clears throat> new units, spread about the entire community at a cost of about $51 million. More recently, HUD has said the 750 units was just the starting point. And they're now up to about 10,000 units. So you have to take a look at Westchester as being the, the base case, the first case that really ever challenged a municipality and took them through federal court and forced 
a, a compliant uh, settlement agreement. Just uh, Google HUD Westchester settlement and you'll see the document right there and you can read it. Uh, but all these documents are on the internet. <coughs> Question? Uh, yes. Oh. Um, just curious, how did the planners get so much authority? I mean, in one sense, we all want to be able to control our own towns, not control, but have an input locally. And I'm just wondering, how did the planners who are unelected get such authority to pass a roadmap or an island? Um, you know, they are a public official. They have duties to do. Um, you could probably argue that there are many town officials that have authority that you're scratching your head saying, how did they get that much authority? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, but the planners have a mission, uh, which, you know, planners have to do what they do best. They, they have to plan for the best uh, interests of the community. Now, that clearly is their vision of what the best interest for the community is, and that's where probably some people take issue with it, is it may not be everybody's best interest. So, yes, planners have some authority these days. Question, yes, yeah. Um, I've been, I have two questions, actually. The first one is, I've been to a couple of different town council meetings, you know, across the state, and it seems like when you bring up the Westchester County case, the council members say, oh, that won't happen here. That's somewhere else, it's bigger than us. You know, because we're small for some reason, we wouldn't be a target. So I was wondering, number one, if you could speak to that issue and why you would say, yes, it could happen here. And then number two, very concerned because on the Division of Planning's website, it says roadmap, uh, I mean, uh, local comprehensive plans must be submitted and approved by June of 2016. So, to me, in order for them to be submitted and approved by the state, assuming there's going to be reiterations, um, they all need to get started now. So when Speaker Mattiello said it's been shelved, I would guess that almost 39 cities and towns are uh, scurrying to get those plans in order, submitted, approved, um, revisions made, and reapproved. Well, all right. <coughs> Let me start with that question first, and then I'll go to the Westchester question. Uh, I have been pushing my town council to address this issue of AFFH compliance, because when we hand in the new community plan, federal law says that we are required to have a plan that addresses the non-compliance issues. And that's federal law. That's not state law or roadmap. Well, it's sort of roadmap because we signed the contract. but. Federal law demands that if you are non-compliant, you must have a written plan that identifies what the impediments are and what are you expecting to do it. So the impediments could be, in the case of, let's say, Westchester, uh, you go to Scarsdale and you'd better have two or three million dollars to buy a house in Scarsdale. So the impediment was that just the cost of housing was so through the roof and property taxes were some of the highest in the nation. So those were legitimate impediments. And so the question was, what was the, the communities, like Scarsdale, willing to put on the table to say, uh, here's how we will fix it, because we're not compliant to the mandate, the AFFH mandates. And what HUD would be looking for is, well, are you going to charge them a lesser tax? Uh, okay, that sounds good, now that, that helps, and are you going to put you know, large projects in the middle of million dollar neighborhoods. Well, yeah, okay, that'll help, and so that's good. In other words, HUD was looking for the community itself to develop the plan, but HUD ultimately had authority to say whether the plan was good, bad, or indifferent. Now, the relevance of the Westchester case, okay, <clears throat> I'll use a, I have to use a legal term here. If you actually pull down the documents of the Westchester case, you will see that it was filed under what's called XREL. <clears throat> now, what does XREL mean? It means that you're bringing the lawsuit on behalf of a government entity or some entity, and at the end of the day, it's that entity that'll have to work out all the settlement. So you're a concerned citizen, and you bring the case, as uh, it was the anti-discrimination center that actually brought the case, the Westchester case, but they brought it XREL on behalf of the government, the government being HUD. So at the end of the day, when 
Judge Cote said, okay, everybody in a room, we're going to do a settlement. It wasn't the anti-discrimination center that was in the room making the settlement. It was HUD. So HUD made the rules on what that settlement would look like. So now the question is, <clears throat> what is HUD's view of Roadmap Rhode Island and AFFH compliance? Because you can go to the Westchester case and actually find out what HUD was thinking because they were the one that wrote the settlement. And you can read all of the compliance mandates and you can read all the follow-up documents that have happened since. And you get a picture of when Rhode Island signed this agreement, this contract that said we will follow the six livability principles. One of those livability principles is affirmatively furthering fair housing. So we're, we've got a contract out there. You want to know what that contract means? Go to the Westchester case because it was HUD that wrote that. Does that answer the question? Okay. What do you know about uh, the, the monitors, the people who will enforce this, the CAC? Well, the, the okay. Uh, there's some debate as to whether or not the Social Equity Advisory Committee on the roadmap will actually exist. Uh, it, it, some people are saying, no, it's, that was just to build a roadmap, and they won't necessarily be uh, a part of a roadmap going forward. I, I don't know if that's true or not. The point is, it, the monitors don't have authority to bring any action on their own. The action could be brought by uh, a citizen, a, a municipality, uh, the planning board. Anyone can bring an action ex rel. And you or I could go out and file a lawsuit against any municipality in the same way that uh, the Westchester case was brought. So to say that this, the Social Equity Advisory Committee is probably not as important is understanding that in terms of AFFH compliance, remember, it's federal dollars. You're a taxpayer. You have standing to say, I don't like the way my tax dollars are being spent in any town USA, so on behalf of the government, I'm filing this lawsuit. <coughs> now, that actually happened in Dallas. <clears throat> um, a similar case to the Westchester case was filed in Dallas for about the same reasons. HUD was uh, moving forward, and the way these cases are settled, it's, it's, they're filed under what's called the whistleblower statute. So the people who actually are first to file in this case, it was the Anti-Discrimination Center in Westchester, and it was another organization in Dallas. They were sort of licking their chops, saying, wow, look at this settlement. We're going to get 20% of this? Wow. HUD instead settled without them, leaving them sort of up the creek. They didn't get anything. And HUD told them, well, if you want to continue with this lawsuit and try and recover some money, that's up to you. But HUD basically pulled the rug out from under them and said, uh, we're going to settle and you're not going to get anything because the settlement that they entered into in the Dallas case was nothing more than telling the Dallas municipality, you've got to rewrite your analysis of impediments document. And so there was no, in other words, there was no monetary damage. It was just a matter of just go rewrite your documents. Now, there was a lot of speculation on how that actually um, evolved and you can go on the internet and you can read all the backroom stuff that went on in that case but it was the Dallas case similar to the Westchester case. Okay. Any other questions? Oh. Okay. Um, up at the uh, State House we're working on putting some legislation in for giving the towns an opt-out provision so they can opt out a roadmap and use their own comprehensive plan and but the way I understand it, it won't protect the towns from the HUD mandates, and uh, so it's two separate things. I don't know if you could uh, okay. explain uh, that a little bit. When, when you take HUD community development block grants, home funds, you, you're actually under a contractual obligation with HUD. It's a contract. So um, Article One of the U.S. Constitution says that no state shall pass any law that inhibits the, um, the contracts. So the state can't write a law that gets in between the contract that a community has between itself and HUD. So you take HUD money, you've certified in writing, you know, get, get a HUD grant, get one of the CDBG grants, and it'll say, you know, I certify compliance and there's a whole bunch of stuff that you're signing off to. It is a contract. 
And so what, what you have to understand is that you can't, the state cannot get in between a community that willingly takes community development block grants. It's a, you know, it, you can't do anything about that up with a state law. Right. And uh, by the way, I need to say this, I am not an attorney, nothing I am saying is legal <laughs> advice. It is something that I am suggesting you check further with a competent attorney, which I am not. So, um, the, the question I think is a little bit different uh, in terms of whether or not you can opt out and say, I want nothing to do with HUD money anymore. That, that's a different issue. So, it's, it's sort of counterproductive to opt out and continue taking HUD money because you would accomplish nothing. So, when you opt out, if you did opt out, the community really needs to understand, I do not want to take HUD money anymore. Yes. Um, Gary, the question I got, I think, is a uh, uh, little side around. Uh, entitlement communities allowed to take HUD money through Rhode Island Housing Association without uh, living by those HUD mandates? Well, no. Rhode Island Housing and uh, the people who actually administer what are called non-entitlement grants. Mm -hmm. So entitlement grants might be Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls. Uh, with socket, those are entitlement <coughs> communities, and they go directly to HUD. Non-entitlement communities go through the state, and so it's like everyone else. And when you go through the state, you have to follow the process because you're signing a contract. There's no way to get around that con contractual obligation. But you, you have to follow the rules, I guess, and HUD makes it very clear what those rules are. Okay. So, so Richmond being a non-entitlement community, if it accepted any money from the state, that was HUD money, would still have to follow the HUD rules? Yes. Okay. Everybody has to be, I mean, the, the rule is since 1968, you had to be compliant to affirmatively furthering fair housing. Yeah. It, it was just never enforced in yeah. the last 45 yeah, years. Yeah, it's, it's got teeth now. It's got teeth. Yeah. Okay. If there are no other questions, thank you very much for coming on on a bitterly cold evening. <laughs> <laughs>